Hey guys, before we get to TNL, we've got exciting news for you. The TNL team and others from the Bulwark, we are going to go on a swing state tour uh, just a couple weeks before the election on October 17th, 18th, and 19th. On the 17th, we will be in Philadelphia. On the 18th, we will be in Pittsburgh. And on the 19th, we will be somewhere in the Detroit vicinity. It is coming together fast and furious, but we are going to be there. So if you are anywhere near Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, or Detroit, we want you to come see us, come hang out with us, come be with us in those last anxiety-filled uh, couple of weeks before the election. We want to see you. We want to get out there. Uh, and let's let's bring this thing home. JVL, how excited are you to go out and do this? I mean, I'm going to bring all of my Xanaxes. And, uh, you know, I, I would be, it would be wrong for me to simply hand them out to TNL listeners who need wrong. them at the shows. And so I won't do that. But uh, this is how, how the hell, how else are we supposed to get through these last four weeks? There's only one way together, together. together. So come hang out with us. We will give you more information soon, uh, but save the date. I want you to save the date because we're coming. Hello, everyone. I'm JVL here with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller of The Bulwark. Last night, Tim Walls and J.D. Vance got it on. And uh, we, we did a live stream about this last night. I know a little bit about what Sarah thought last night. I don't really know what Tim thought. So, Tim, let me let me give you pride of place here. Okay. Just let me put a quarter yeah, in the machine. Know if they got How it did it on. go? I don't know if they got it on. It was maybe well, more of a Well, in a cuddle. Midwestern way. Yeah, it was maybe more of a heavy pet. Um, but, uh, look, I, I mean, I, so at the biggest possible picture, I think that J.D. Vance's inability to answer whether or not Donald Trump won the 2020 election, uh, well, whether Donald Trump lost the 2020 election, to put it uh, more, uh, to put it more accurately, uh, is uh, disqualifying and is probably the only thing we remember from the debate in four years uh, when we're thinking back. Like the only thing we remember from the debate four years ago is the the fly. Like, do you remember anything Mike Pence actually said in the debate four years ago? I don't. And so, Kamala is saying I'm speaking was another. Well, I just sure. <laughs> okay, good. Fair. That's fair. Um, and so I, I think that it was pretty unfortunate that that happened in the 96th minute of the debate uh, after nobody's watching. It's pretty fortunate that it's 2024 and pretty much everybody that is a persuadable voter is only going to see that clip on TikTok or YouTube anyway because they were not watching 90 minutes of the debate. I texted uh, my brother last night about halfway through and I was like, I just I need a non-political person's take. Like, is this going the same way I think it is? And he was like, I turned it to WNBA playoffs about 20 minutes in. And I think that's basically the, the median view of people that my brother's not persuadable, but for people that are the types of people that haven't already rendered a judgment on this race. Um, so I think that's good for Tim Walls and uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, that said, like, I, I don't, I just don't, the Tim Walls buddy buddy strategy for me just didn't hit. Um, I, 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 I think that if you, there have been some flash polls post debate that he still has a po positive favorability. So maybe it works out in the end. Um, some of my Democratic friends were persuasive to me that, like, on the actual issues, healthcare, climate change, like he was staking out more, you know, uh, uh, issues that have broader popular support. I'm for all that. I, I just, I don't know how you can stand on a debate stage with somebody that you're trying to disqualify as too extreme because Project 2025 is a nightmarish hellscape for the future of the country. And the man that he's running with wants to be a dictator on day one. I, I don't know how you can kind of live together with these guys are a threat to democracy and this person is a sociopath in service to somebody that is a threat to democracy and also you know buddy in your heart i think i think you want the same thing i do and i just gotta agree with you on that position and i just gotta agree with you on that position like all that shit rubbed me the wrong way maybe it wasn't for me and that's fine um but uh that part uh, really, really frustrates me. Uh, the final thing I'll say about this is just, I, I also just think I was watching you guys last night. I know that Sarah agrees with me because I see her nodding right now. I, I know that she agreed with me last night. Uh, it's, po it's possible Tim Walls isn't for us. Like, and so 
Okay. I, I do feel like it's a little bit of an Abbott and Costello routine with my with the listeners and with my Democratic friends sometimes here, where I'm like, I don't know that Tim Walz helps that much with the center right Nikki Haley voters or the the male twenty to forty year olds who aren't paying that cl- close attention to the race. I I don't think he's I don't think he really appeals to those two key demographics. And then my friend or the listener will say, but I love him. And I'm like, I know you do. Yeah, but that that's right. I agree with that. I understand that you like him. But I don't know that he's a fit for that. And then they'll come back and be like, well, so-and-so I know likes. <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel like we're doing a who's on first routine going over and over again. And I, I still just remain unsure that he is doing that much for the persuadable groups. But, you know, maybe just kind of putting a positive happy sheen and keeping the Dems happy is enough. Um, uh, uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later. Well, this is the, the thing, right? I mean, you have to look at Walt's in the context of what four weeks ago five weeks ago when harris was still putting back together the biden coalition and so it is possible that in order to get to this point you had to bring all of those people on board and avoid the fight over some other candidate whose nickname might be shosh Shapiro. Sure. And, and do uh, we really want, I mean, you know, do we, did we really want Josh Shapiro in the middle of a shooting war last night? I, yeah, there could have been other problems. I do sure. think Josh Shapiro certainly would have been more emotionally satisfying for the people on this panel last night. Right. That's not the purpose of the election, but I, I, I you know, I would have enjoyed it. <laughs> and, and I also think he would have done better at disqualifying J.D. Vance. Sarah, on a scale of one to ten. How down on Tim Walls are you this morning? Uh, I'm not so down on Tim Walls. Cool. That's sort of not my overall takeaway after sleeping on it. Um, okay. Where are you after sleeping on it? So two things. I, I did. I was going through the, the flash polls afterwards. CBS had some, you know, the who won the debate. And like it was all basically tied. Right. And my my takeaway from it's basically tied is folks on the left thought Tim Walls was great and folks on the right uh, thought J.D. Vance was great and everybody goes home to their corners. Um, I will I'm doing focus groups today. I'm a little skeptical of how much a vice presidential debate. On one hand, I know that a vice presidential debate doesn't matter a great deal uh, to voters. On the other hand. There's the, the the truncated nature of Kamala Harris's campaign. The fact that the number one thing you hear from undecided voters is like they're they're kind of looking for more information. Uh, they want to know that like they're not going to get the wool pulled over their eyes by a San Francisco progressive. Uh, and so like they want to know, can I trust these people? And like maybe Walls was fine for that last night. Like one thing that I think is really important, if like. Tim's right about it not being for us. And I think that we tend to respond to a J.D. Vance because we know J.D. Vance. Like Mm. that guy is like the prep school guy who's smart uh, and how smart he and he was even like more emotionally intelligent last night. I think the part that was difficult to stomach from him was the fact that he was being emotionally intelligent about the places where Republicans are failing right now. Right. And so he was like doing some damage control in ways that like felt sort of effective to people like us who are worried about people one standard deviation from us trying to get there on the Walls Harris campaign. And we just feel like that person probably watched J.D. Vance and was like, this guy doesn't seem like a lunatic. Like all of these clips I've been seeing of him, you know, they don't do him justice. He's good. And we know both those people and we know J.D. Vance. And so we think about it in those terms. But Can I just add one little point yeah. on this? Do you, do you remember where you're going? Just because I think it's such a good point. But I just want to emphasize it even more. We don't just know J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance is us. Yeah. Was us. That's right. J.D. Vance was a, Sarah's colleague at The Atlantic writing about how terrible Donald Trump is. Okay. And, and, and he was a pundit and a blogger that. and a podcaster. And he sucked up to the worst fucking person in America so good that he became the vice president and it would be fucking nice to see somebody knock him down a peg. That- and I think that, that that is like the emotional element of this that I was watching last night. And then I was like, nope, the nice guy coach thing is just not what I'm looking for tonight. 
Yeah. And and I understand that there's a whole nother group of people for whom that is like not a consideration. I, I don't want to say that our people are nothing, though, because they're going to be part of the key swing demographic that is important in Georgia. But like that, I, I think for some, some sometimes for my Democratic listeners, like, why are you so mad about this? Like, that's part of why I, I, I'm like, this is crazy. You're going to let this fucking sociopath Patrick Bateman asshole get away with this shit. No, no. I put me in coach. Yeah. Put me up on that stage because I've got a few haymakers I want to punch throw the, at this guy before we check you back in to do the oh hey yeah let's let's help people get let school lunches because that's also important. But I, I kind of wanted both. Yeah, and I'm going to just d- double down on something Tim said that I think is a good point is that it felt a little bit like Walls was giving Vance emotional cover with the nodding it, like because this is where I feel this in my bones, right? You guys know me, right? Like, I want civility. I want substance. And so, I like, you sort of crave it, and you see him treating J.D. Vance in this kind way. Walls clearly has this affirming nature, right? Wherever he is, he's trying to find common ground with a person. And I can, as a human, really identify and like that about Walls. I also feel like it's insufficient to the moment And there is something almost chilling about that debate happening in this very normal range of substance and civility where the backdrop is that guy said he wouldn't certify elections. Like the one job, Will Salatin's got a whole piece about this, but like the one job of a vice president is to certify elections. And he said he wouldn't do it in previous times. He didn't get pushed on that. The way he needed to. And like it did come up only very little bit at the end. And Walls like doesn't have it in him to go for the jugular. And that and I think that the reason to to, just to underscore something that Tim was saying about like the people who really like Walls. The thing about Walls is that he's not just a football coach. Right. He's actually the football coach that the kids in the Glee Club really liked because he wasn't he he took them seriously and he was empathetic. And as a result, like the left is like, this is our coach. Yeah, man, we love this guy. And so they love when he's up there, when he uses words like knucklehead or whatever, because like he resonated with them. Uh, he is not resonating, I think, with the people that we desperately need him to reach, which is to like do some of the work like you kind of needed to see him. Bobby Knight, yeah. Coach Bobby Knight and throwing like, a chair across yeah, just, the stage, just like, kind of it, what I wanted. Almost like emasculate J.D. Vance a little bit. And, and like, and I didn't, it's not like I wanted him to get up there and make couch jokes or talk about eyeliner. None of that would have been good. But I would have liked to have seen some blood draw early. I, I got a, a very serious comms question. Yeah. Can you do that when the guy on the other side of the stage is wearing his normie skin suit? in the way that jd was yeah. because i have to think that jd was so i mean jd last night was basically 2010 elizabeth warren crossed with 2016 marco rubio with a little bit of light nativism thrown into it and if if walls had come out like hammer and tongs to take him apart i think walls would have looked like a weirdo no, because yeah. JD was just Again. like operating at a a very yeah. high level of like, yeah, look, we're all you know. Oh man, breaks my heart that your son was exposed to to school shootings, and that's just you know. Yeah, Christ I have, have look, mercy. Some of this, some of this, and we all knew this going in was JD Vance was going to be a smarmy prick and and very smooth, and I, I didn't actually know how well he was going to do it, like pretending to have emotional concern for others yeah that yeah. was surpri- that was impressive his great friend like, he who he loves he's what he's headed that for his friend who had the abortion who saved her life he's like oh, i love you babe yeah yeah i did like i saw one tweet about this which i did like which is like tim walls i love it we love and care about women <laughs> jd vance i love one woman hello woman um <laughs> i did kind of like that <laughs> um and then, uh, but um yeah I, look again this is. I was talking with Simone Sanders about this late night on on MS last night, and because and she was she was basically with us, on, me and Sarah, on this point, 
And she was like, I'm getting a lot of pushback from people that are like, you didn't, you don't want Tim Walls doing the haymaker thing for all the reasons you just laid out, JVL, JVL. And I agree with that. That's not what I'm asking for. I'm just saying there were there were a few opportunities, like when when JD Vance is saying that like what we really need to do to stop school shootings is is have better door locks to be like, you know, give them the Kamala Harris eyes, be like door locks, JD. Like they not have, you know, are we the only nation that has bad door locks? You know, maybe double them, like, pane windows. I hear yeah, double like, pane anyway, windows very but, nice. But the other thing is to have a couple of the quotes ready and be like, this guy sounds very reason like rather than saying, I believe that you are in your heart care about the same issues as me. Or you're making some good points I agree with. Rather than that, how about a how about a different way of Minnesota nice, passive aggressive Minnesota nice? This guy sounds like he cares very much about these issues, but he's in other settings. Here's what he said. Uh, you put this in your article last night, JVL. Um, you know, he said that that Donald Trump should be able to do whatever he wants as the president, and if the Supreme Court overrules him, he should say. Okay, great. Try me or whatever the exact quote was. I don't have it in front of me. I do. You know, this guy says he cares about abortion now or cares about his friend who had an abortion now. And I appreciate he might care about his friend who has an abortion. But here's what he said about a 10 year old girl who got raped and how he said this is just a tough situation, but sometimes you got to deal with it. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, just give me a couple of the like of those. That's that's. That's what I, that's what that's what could have leveled it up for me last night, and and I do think it takes it to, again, it's like well the polls said it was fine. I agree, they went to their corners. I'm not satisfied with just fine right now though. Yeah. I, it's a really close race, and and I think and I, and I, I think that like the main divide from the people I was talking to last night at MSNBC was the divide between people who feel like we're on the right track, and it's like that was good. And people who are like, I'm actually panicked that this race is way too close and I need it a little bit more than just good, you know, like just fine. Well, and and let's just talk about like what what really the wash is fine in the sense that if you thought that it was going to be if you're like, man, J.D. Vance is really talented and walls like he's not built for this in particular. He's built for a lot of other yeah. things, but he's not built for this. Like I'm happy with a wash, you know, sure. because whatever. The thing is, is that now with a little bit of the Harris campaign under our belt, we can see a few patterns that like wasn't that easy to discern. Um, and it, JBL, it goes a little bit to the newsletter that you wrote uh, last week, I think, about the things that Harris needed to do that you and I argued a little bit about. And the, the piece that you articulated the most, and this is a comms thing, was about m momentum and sustaining momentum and owning news cycles. And you only get a few inflection points where people are really paying attention. And so you sort of want to maximize them and then use them to cruise and build on, right? And, like, yeah. that didn't give you that last night, right? It didn't give you um, the sort of energy pickup. And and the, the Kamala Harris campaign has been, like, kind of moving from inflection point to inflection point to inflection point. They've been doing very well at the inflection points. The parts that they have not been capitalizing as well on is sort of sustaining those that momentum in the in-between times. And I think last night was maybe the first time we saw them not get that momentum bounce uh, that you kind of need here going into the last five weeks. I'm not sure there'll be another debate. Maybe there will be. Um, if there is, it's because of what JVL wrote last night where Donald Trump uh, – uh, last night looked at J.D. Vance and was like, screw this guy. I thinks he's better than me, this slick little uh, – like, I got to get in there and show that I'm the one who dominates uh, because a bunch of people are going to talk about how he was a better debater than I was. He had a better debate and that Trump won't be able to handle that. And he did, Donald. J.D. had a very much, much, much better debate than you. <laughs> Donald Trump, if you're listening. It, but just on the walls thing, because people get mad at us when they're like – I was watching the chat last night and people – were like infuriated that we were not being better about walls. There were like, walls crushed. And I was like, you know what, guys? If you need that kind of hopium, like if you this need This is a Wendy's. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is no, not I'm sorry. This is not where you're gonna get it. That being said, I do think it's fair to wonder about our like perspective on this because I I think Tim Tim is articulating something well um, that I think I feel, which is, I think that liberals last night don't realize how much we loathe, detest, and ultimately fear J.D. Vance. Uh, that that J.D. Vance is um, sort of the the 
the very creepy, very chilling coda to what Donald Trump is doing. And I think we want to see this thing nipped in the bud. We want to see this guy torn apart. We want him exposed for what he is. And so I think we are because it's not really about walls for us. It's about Vance. And uh, I think we so like I both think that the commenters saying that walls killed it are not reading this correctly uh, and they're not going to get that from us if that's what they need. On the other hand, I do think we have like a rage blind spot. Actually, I'm not sure. I think it's a blind spot, but we do have a thing that we want to accomplish, which is like this guy like, stop treating this like it's a normal debate. Don't treat yeah. this guy like a normal guy. Don't treat this moment like a normal moment. None of it's normal. And watching everybody pantomime like it is and even score it in these conventional ways uh, is like yeah. panic inducing for us. I want to annihilate them in a landslide. Like, like is that not too much to hope for right it's now? Way too much. Like, that is too much to hope for. It is? Yeah. Let me, uh, let me, we let can't me, try to try. Let me talk for a minute. Um, okay. Two two things. Please. First of all, I think the three of us are in agreement that Kamala Harris has run a very, very smart and good campaign. Yes? Fair to say? Mostly. Mostly. Not, not perfect. But yeah. Two days after Biden's withdrawal, Harris was at 45.9%. Today, she is at 493 that's how little that's the world has moved. Now, it's great. We'll take it, right? Wait, that could be the mean? difference between winning what, what and do you losing. Mean she's at, do you mean what, 49? Her, her, her polling average, her, her national 49.3. polling average. And sorry, what was it when Biden dropped so out? So we've gone, we've gone from 45.9 to 49.3. 4.4 points. As well as everything has three gone point, for her. 3.4 points. Three, sorry, 3.4. Like this is, you know, we are operating. Within this incredibly narrow band, and she's not even over 50% yet, uh, which is something that worries us. But I, I want to read, this is the thing that I, 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 I just can't believe the moderators didn't ask about this last night. So in 2021, uh, J.D. Vance goes on a podcast with Jack Murphy. He's the guy who loves getting pegged while watching other guys rail his wife. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is what J.D. Vance said. I'm sorry, I have to read a little bit for you. Uh, I think Trump is going to run again in 2024. I think that what Trump should do, if I was giving him one piece of advice, fire every single mid-level bureaucrat, every civil servant in the administrative state, replace them with our people. And when the courts stop you, stand before the country and say, the chief justice has made his ruling. Now let him enforce it. We are in a late Republican period. If we're going to push back against it, we're going to have to get pretty wild and pretty far out there and go in directions that a lot of conservatives right now are uncomfortable with. How do you not ask the guy who wants to be vice president of the United States what the fuck that means? I don't know. I I just I, I I'm sorry. I don't want to, like, turn this into a grade the moderators thing. But that strikes me as like one of the most important things that J.D. Vance has said in the course of his political career. It has direct bearing on how he performed the duties of the vice president, it has direct bearing on how he views the actual system of government in the United States. And instead, as as you guys have said, we had this like totally normal debate, right? Just, yeah, yeah, no, well, you know, we have some agreements on energy policy and some disagreements on how we should handle the windows at schools and stuff. But, uh, <laughs> you know, like, we'll all just pretend that in other contexts, he doesn't call for the president of the United States defying orders from the Supreme Court. Because we're in a late Republic period. The other just thing about that sentence is, again, if you just think about the context of which we came, um, J.D. Vance last night positioned himself basically as like a compassionate MAGA. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, we tried to fix Obamacare and, you know, we care about women and da 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 And like, I, like he positioned himself, I think, decently effectively as smart. I, I, he didn't appeal, like, you know what I mean? He's not winning over any liberals. But like he just positioned himself as like, oh, I'm a kind of a rational MAGA, reasonable. I'm not quite as crazy as Trump. I care more about people like you than he does. Um, and... 
like when in reality that quote the most interesting part of that quote maybe is the part that like i want to go somewhere where many conservatives aren't even comfortable with right like yeah. I, when he's on the on the white nationalist podcast circuit he's out there going you know like the ted cruises of the world they're a little bit too mainstream they're not radical enough for where we need to go I don't think anybody who is not a political obsessive who watched that debate last night came away thinking, oh, J.D. Vance is on the radical end of the GOP. And Donald Trump picked somebody to be his VP that is that is the most extreme anti-democratic senator he could have possibly chosen. Uh, and so that's that's also flung. <laughs> that's also frustrating. Now that adds to my frustration. A little I bit came onto the plot actually feeling pretty positive, but the more we talk about it, the more frustrated. It's Sarah's face. I All right. We're going to look forward on this in a second. Uh, Sarah, would you care to share a message from our sponsor? I do. Support for today's episode comes from OneSkin. Did you have a little too much fun in the sun this summer? It's no secret that UV rays can take a toll on our skin, leaving it dry, tired, and less vibrant. If you want to hit the undo button on UV-induced aging, say hello to OneSkin, your secret weapon against summer's toll on your skin. One Skin products are all powered by the revolutionary OS01 peptide. This proprietary peptide is scientifically proven to reduce dysfunctional, also called senescent cells, a central source of skin aging. Their scientists have shown that it can actually reverse the biological age of skin by several years in their groundbreaking research. Healthier, more youthful-looking skin doesn't just look great, which we all want, obviously, but it is good for your overall health, too. As the leaves change color this fall, help your skin undergo its own transformation with One Skin. Their products work tirelessly to repair, rejuvenate, and erase the signs of summer damage, ensuring you step into this new season with the healthiest skin of your life. Head over to oneskin.co and explore how their products can become your skin's new savior. For a limited time, our listeners can get 15% off OneSkin with our code the next level at oneskin.co. You guys know if you listen to me and George, we both love this product. We both use it. It's why I have baby soft skin. OneSkin is the world's first skin longevity company. OneSkin addresses skin health at the molecular level, targeting the root causes of aging so skin behaves, feels, and appears younger. It's time to get started with your new face, eye, and body routine at a discounted rate today. Get 15% off with the code the next level at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with code the next level. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. We only have one body, one skin, and only you can choose to make it better. Age healthy with one skin. So we're not quite at closing argument stages of this campaign. We're close. 34 days left. Uh, where where do we go from here? I mean, does does JD go back to being MAGA edgelord for the, the last five weeks to, to pump up turnout? Because Trump's entire theory is... He's got to turn out his base. Does J.D. try to be closing the sale with normie voters in Pennsylvania? Is that like what? What What do we think the next four weeks looks like here, Sarah? So I think that both campaigns right now, now that we do have the inflection points behind us, right? And it's basically down to like the campaign sprint here at the end. Uh there's only a few things you can do. You got your paid advertising strategy. You got your campaign, uh, like, route, right? You're barnstorming all the swings. You're holding your big rallies. Uh, and you're addressing events as they unfold, right? Like, we're in the middle of a bunch of sort of upheaval. Uh, but I do think both campaigns have been sort of weirdly cautious, right? Not just – not both of them. Like, Kamala is not visible enough. She's not out there enough. Um I, as I told a reporter the other day, uh, and it's the same, it's the same, uh, what, mentality we apply to our YouTube. More is more. More is more. We just need more, more. The more people see her, the more they like her. Get out there. Tim Walls is done prepping. He needs to be out there. Go do places where you thrive. But also, the Trump campaign seems to be hiding Trump a little bit. Because the other thing we know is that the more people see of Donald Trump, the less they like him. Did you see Trump yesterday? Uh, I did Happy see him Papa yesterday. Trumpy? Yeah, I quote tweeted what you said. He's he is Trump looks terrible. Like they are they are Bidening 
him right now. Could they could they try to do to him what the Trump campaign did to Hillary with the health thing? No, I, do you well, remember I don't know like a month about left? You remember the month left? They were like, yeah, "Oh, do. Hillary just collapsed." Or like, just could you, could you, could you do that to Trump? Do you think? Uh, I don't know about the Hillary thing. They should do to him what they did to Biden. Trump is old and unfit. Trump can't do this job. Trump is tired. Trump. Why is Melania just letting him go out there? This is elder abuse, guys. Like the fact that we are, uh, like Trump. Trump's doing much less than he did before. He's doing it with much less vigor. Um, and I don't I think his team is keeping him pretty scripted, uh, pretty much in friendly terrain. So, like, I don't know. Yeah, I think we just need more offense now. Like and maybe I'm still like in desperate offense mode from last night. But I feel like nobody can play it safe. It's too close. Like uh, and Kamala's got to start going. She's got to go close hard here. Tim. Yeah, I just. um it's interesting. I'm, after we are together, um, I'm going to tape with Messina. Um, and so I'm kind of interested to see what he has to say about this. Because the thing that has me a little nervous is, you know, Pluff is in there with in in uh, in Kamala world. He's super smart, talented, but like was a base guy. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that was his element in the Obama campaign. You know, Axelrod was like the messaging and like the positioning and uh, and and Pluff was like, we're going to take this machine and turn out as many people as possible. I'm happy to have somebody like that there. I'm worried that like that's what phase of the campaign they think we're in, though. I'm just I, I'm a little nervous about that. I would be interested to see what Messina says about it because I just I think I, I forget I'm I'm. I'm doing too much more is more. So I forget where I talked about this, but like when you're watching the ads over uh, when I was watching the ads during football, it's, um, you know, I, the, the Kyle ads are kind of like gauzy and positive and like a little bit of contrast. And like, you know, let's try, you know, let's keep everybody feeling it. It was sort of similar to the Tim walls vibes last night. Like the, and the, the Trump ads are like, Kamala is going to let transgender, you know, prisoners change their sex, sex change then, surgeries you know, for and prisoners. Then come, and then yeah. she's going to open the prisons and the sex change prisoners are going to come to your house and slit your throat. I mean, it's like, OK. And so I, I maybe that doesn't work. So I, I just I'm worried that we're the kind of like that we've reached that sort of part of the campaign where like Trump, the Trump team is going to do, you know, air cover um, just really kind of salt the earth type stuff on her. And they're going to do like, uh, we've got to turn out this anti-Trump coalition and keep it as broad and positive as possible. And it might, that might be enough to win, but it just gives me the butterflies in my belly because like, okay. is it, it, is, it is close. Yeah. Cause, cause we have a cl- very, like you asked two months ago, JV, like, what is the equilibrium state of the race? And I, I, think I, I wonder if they, now. Like I think two. they think that we're at it. And I'm like, I don't know, man. The longshoremen, those fuckers. We do, what, five minutes on those assholes? Those assholes are striking. Yes. I'll, I'll then, write that down. Okay, great. And then, and then you know, we've got Israel and Iran, Iran attacking each other. I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just think there are a lot of wild cards out there in the world. Yeah. Even I think though the race we're at is the equilibrium. I, I, maybe I'm wrong. This is this is not a I my, I have a a theory which is that we actually have hit the equilibrium point, mm-hmm. and the equilibrium point in this race is Harris plus two. Right, and uh, that Harris winning by five simply is not in the cards, uh, and that this will be a one and a half to three and a half point victory for her in the popular vote and. We will all simply be rolling dice on the seven different swing states, and you know who knows how it all comes up. Is that does that strike you as like crazy wrong, obviously wrong, or maybe uh, right? I, I mean, I would have a wider range. I don't. I, I think that the potential for a polling error is real. Um, I, I to, I'm just sniffing the two. There are two things that I've had. One, I had a call from a from a former pollster that I used to work with. Former Republican guy's kind of out of the game, super smart. And he's just like, my spidey sense is up on this stuff. He's like, I don't, he's like, I don't think these guys really know what the, what the electorate's going to look like as much as they think they do. And, and, and he, in the herding, 
he pointed this out, but the, the, the call came separately from when I kept, I was just, I'm like, why is every Pennsylvania poll come with plus two to tide? It's like, that can't be, that is not math, actually. It feels like, like groupthink. Really, it feels like groupthink. Yeah, it feels it, like they're all trying to stay in the margin with each other so that nobody's yeah. the big outlier. Right. And the only people with the stones to be outliers are like the New York Times and Nate Cohn. And those polls aren't great. Yeah, or partisans going the yeah, other way, like right. either way, right? And so it's just Wait, like, so. Which way do you think it's wrong? I, I don't know. I'm just saying math, okay. like real math, real statistics. You know, would sh- if you took 20 polls of Pennsylvania, and the real race is Kamala plus tr- two, there would there would be polls on the outside of the bell curve. Like there would be polls that show her up eight, and polls that show Trump up four. That that's how statistics works. If there are 20 polls and 18 of them show show it within a two point range. <laughs> To me, that seems like some of these pollsters are cooking the books. Yeah. Turn it into So that worries me. That's all, that's so, all I'm Sarah, saying. What so, so that just makes, to, to circle back to the point why we were talking about that, that leaves me open to the fact that the actual race is outside that that band that you're talking about. And, yeah. that, and that what we're really seeing is pollster hurting. Um, but I, it's hard to know. I mean, how would we know? Can I, and I'm going to, here's the thing that Tim said that I think is, um, what I'm also struggling with, and I think is the great unknown about this race, is what does this electorate look like? We have been going through a sustained electoral uh, redefinition of the parties, uh, right? We are, we are, voters have been moving, right? There's a political realignment that has been like a tectonic shift going slowly. I think that we are really struggling to understand where Hispanics are generally. Uh, I think we're struggling to figure out like, I mean, if I'm Trump and I'm thinking about fundamentals and I'm saying, OK, well, I've got all these young men. That's my that's my big turnout. Well, on one hand, I sit there and go, boy, would you want to bet your campaign on young men like 28 year old men? I sure wouldn't. That has been the, the least reliable demographic uh, in elections, period. On the other hand, are those young men in such a state, uh, living in the manosphere, being mad, uh, not, you know, I, that they actually do turn out in droves. Like, what does the electorate look like? What do, do young people like we see we see some polls where there's this magic threshold. Hamby talks about this with the youths uh, where you got to get to 60 percent with young people. Um, OK, well, but like at some point, those like threshold numbers are sort of meaningless in the face of. Who is turning out? What does this what does this new electorate look like? What does it look like for all of these people who for the last decade now have grown up in an environment where Trump is the, the normalized version of what the Republican Party is? Right. And like all this chaos and insanity, like it's weird, like it's not weird, but it is interesting to me that Kamala Harris, a black woman who was a San Francisco progressive, is doing her best with white voters over 50. Now, that's good on one hand, because there's a lot of those people in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin and Nebraska, too. And those are real reliable voters. Are there more of them, though, than the low info, low, um, uh, low propensity, right? Younger voters who like might turn out in these big presidential elections and don't vote any other time or care. Right. That's what Donald Trump has done. That's been his trick in every election is find a whole bunch of people. And that world, that's a pretty large pool. And so like, yeah. I just agree with Tim that us not knowing what the electorate looks like, it's why we end up with the vibes as much because I think fundamentals have changed a lot. Like benefits of incumbency, like I- I- even there, who's the incumbent right now? Is Trump the incumbent or is Kamala Harris the incumbent? Neither of them are kind of the incumbent, right? Both of them are kind of yeah, the incumbent. Neither and both. Which one's the change agent? The 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 woman who seems uh, who is younger, more vibrant, looks demographically like a like a turn the page kind of person, uh, or the burn it all down wild card guy that everybody thinks is outside the establishment order. Like it's just a really it it is hard um, to gauge, which is why I think there's sort of nothing to do. And like, I I literally, I go back and forth between being like, she's going to blow him out. 
Like she's they are everybody's undercounting how much she is the change candidate. Independents are going to break her way. She's going to blow them out to this. This this jackass is going to win Pennsylvania by 20,000 votes. Uh, and it's going to be about a multiracial working class coalition in places like Pennsylvania that put him over the top. She drops a little bit with, with black and Hispanic voters. He does better with these white union members. Yeah. Mm. I just want to say one more thing. If you think we're just TDS panicked, crazy bedwetting, which is my check on Fair. myself sometimes. I, I, at, at 30 Rock last night, this is what I was, what I was asking. I was like, come on, you really think? A shocking number of prominent Democrats last, like, that were there last night that were like, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I think that maybe he wins if it's today. Because I was like, I was expecting me to be the negative. I was expecting me to be the rain cloud. And I was like, okay. So that was a little bit concerning to me, but I agree with you. I just, I, I'll, long story short, I think the band is wider, and and I and I'll be interested to see whether they, the team who have more data than us, end up running this thing out like we're just gonna, this is jack up turnout time, or whether they really feel like there's a lot of persuasion left in the in the in the orange and i think that we'll know that in two weeks like we'll know yeah. we'll we'll see what their ad camp copy is the next two weeks and we'll know what their i think it's is. turnout time frankly yeah, me too. I, that's I, what i, I, that's what I, I worry. think that this is yeah. this is base time and she she's got a jack up turnout and and i'll say um you know, I guess this is uh, my like strategic hat from like what I'm actually doing in the ground, right? With my other hat on. It's like we think we're moving into the more rural areas. So like we think that the job is more or less done with a lot of the suburban sort of swiggier voters. And the question is, is like, can you hold down his margins in some of these rural areas? Yeah. Uh, we usually don't push into the rural areas, but because of this exact thing that I'm talking about. Uh, we're going to spend the late money trying to to push down. Uh, the ladies. Yeah. The rural ladies. That's right. That's rural white women. working class women. Uh, you got to run up the numbers with her and hold down his numbers with them. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the longshoremen. It has been a while since either of you have felt like real conservatives. But now you have your chance. And uh, it's a little weird for me because I am fairly heavily pro-union, uh, especially private sector unions. I get a little squirrely on public sector unions. But this longshoreman strike being orchestrated by a guy making $900,000 a year as a close friend of Donald Trump, in which the demand seems to be ports can't upgrade technology. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, between, between watching... Tim Walls be buddy buddy with JD Vance right now and do the Minnesota Nice Guy Glee Club moderator thing and the fucking longshoreman. I've 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 never felt more like a Chamber of Commerce Republican in my life. I might put a pocket constitution, <laughs> might pick up a pocket constitution at the bodega here and put that back in my uh you know little breastplate like I used to have. Uh, but no, th these guys are I, like this is. I, this is horrible. I, this is ridiculous. And and JVL used to say that the Biden was the Reagan third term to troll our our liberal progressive listeners. Officially, not the Reagan third term. If he's not going to crack down on these fuckers, <laughs> or at least go there and say like let's turn the screws to try to like force some deal for the next five weeks. I mean, if people are not getting their Amazon deliveries in late October, because these guys who are look, I I don't have any calluses on my hands. If they want, if they want better, higher wages, they're working their asses off. I get that, but like, there's five weeks left in the election. Everybody there's making six figures. This is not the call. Like, like we need to be able to get to the table, get people to work, and work on a deal. Do a deal while we're working. Okay, like that's that what needs that's what needs to be happening here, or else or else we need some scabs. Can you guys? It's <laughs> trying to get some scabs in there for five weeks because this is. That. The political rationale for why Biden wouldn't press the button on the cooling off period, right? Because this is the, you know, so what could Biden do? He could intervene, enforce uh, under Smoot-Hawley a cooling off period of, I think, 80 days or something like that. Uh, in, Hold on, in we which... need to go. Is, is, is it, isn't it Taft-Hartley? Taft-Hartley, Taft right. Sorry. Yeah. One of those old-timey things. Yeah, okay. And uh, 
this is not a group of people who are going to vote for Biden anyway. I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong. But I get well, a sense that on. longshoremen are going to go for Donald Trump like 95 to 5. Look, this no, this is why this is why they they are trying to jam Biden up. This is an attempt to jam Biden up. And the reason is yeah. you put him between the rock of them striking or that people not getting their package and the hard place of being perceived as anti-union at a time when they are doing everything they can to try to hold the numbers with white working class voters by talking about how pro-union they are. Now, look, I'm not pro-union. Sometimes people hear me take a take a shot at teachers unions on this podcast and they get all like, I can't. Sarah did this drive by on teachers unions. I'm sorry. Let me not do a drive by. I think public sector unions <laughs> between whether it is police unions, whether it is teachers unions, they are there to protect the lowest common denominator, the lowest performers. Right. They are they they stymie innovation and and people improving. And then private sector unions, I, I they have a right to exist. I'm not against collective bargaining. Uh, however, there is a tremendous amount of corruption. They also stifle innovation. The reason these longshoremen, they say, are uh, striking is because they are going to they're trying to refuse automation. OK, and I understand I, I understand that they're saying, well, we don't want these good jobs to go away. But like this is where you just don't I, I am I remain f a free market conservative in the sense that like if automation can do the job faster uh, and uh, more Cheaper. efficiently and much more cheaply. Uh, and the longshoremen have to uh, do other things like this is how the this is this is what happens. Um, and when AI takes all of our jobs, um, uh, you know, that'll that'll be what it is. Uh, I just I think that I I so I, and I think and there's also like, have you seen on the waterfront is basically what I want to cry <laughs> like. <laughs> Go watch it. It's very good. Uh, it's early yeah. Marlon Brando. He's very handsome in it. Uh, but look, this is this is to me, to me, this is orchestrated. Uh, and I am the least conspiratorial of us, but it seems like kind of obvious that this is meant to help Trump put Biden in a tough spot. Uh, and is the kind of corrupt crap you get from uh, some of the and look, not all unions are equal. Um, they're really not. There are and and the ones that are doing really good stuff around trade schools, whatever. I'm not going to fight with you guys about all the various permutations of unions. Uh, but I will say this is the kind of stuff that makes me crazy. Break glass, Taft Hartley, press the red button, whatever. It's five weeks. Like like, like we'll, we'll go back to the table at Thanksgiving. I mean, like really, we're going to cut some. That's I, what it and, is, right? It's not. It's yeah. not. But, you and know, you force, it's at, not forcing scabs in. Right. It's different than that. It's, and our uh, buddy Scott Linsico, um was like posting about like the most efficient ports in the world. And, you know, like we don't have any of the top 50. It's like, come on. Guess God. why? I, I, because yeah, I, everybody else is using, right. uh, they're I'm, using right. cheaper, technology. more efficient technology to it's do it. Like, guys, it's 2024. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But this is, this is crazy. I did. I felt like the most... I don't know if I want to. I guess I don't, I don't know if I want to out them. But in the in the bulwark slack, I felt the most bulwark slack sentence ever written was "Let's replace the longshoremen with the Haitians and get back to work." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, <gasps> <laughs> U.S. immigration, U.S.A. immigration. Yeah. Where? Uh, anyway, yeah, that's just what I expect it's, from it's, the I'm cathedral. I'm concerned about the longshoremen. Long story uh, short, yeah, yeah, I. The thing that gets me is the the demand to stop automation because cool. that's like that's out into la la land territory. I mean, it is one thing to to have unions pushing for higher wages and better working conditions and let's get rid of the uh, wheel more Why equitable we should, we should distribution have to carry of the profits. But the idea of like also we want to make it so that we are less efficient so that we can have more job. This is. This would be, I, I said this in, in the Slack, it'd be like the, the MLB Players Union saying, uh, we want to make it so that you no know, teams aren't allowed to cut people hitting under 180. Like, it's, <laughs> that's not the point. The, the point of baseball, whatever. Uh, all right. So I, I wanted to blindside you, Sarah, with this. But uh, we got some news yesterday from Judge Eileen Cannon, who appears to be the only judge in the state of Florida 
because she gets all of the important cases around Donald Trump. And uh, she, I guess all the other judges are on sabbatical. <laughs> um, so you know that she pulled the Trump shooter case. Did you know that? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. This is yeah. good. This counts as my prep for George because we're taping later. So she pulled, uh, because these, you know, these assignments are all totally random. It's just like, the, remember the old lottery with the ping pong balls and the blower and somebody mm-hmm. would do, you know, put it. it's just like that. Uh, and Eileen Cannon, who had just been so overwhelmed by all of her duties on the classified documents case and had to, you know, just put stuff off on, uh, we already have a trial date, November 18. Hmm. Well, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair, We can she's... get that trial started in basically six weeks. No problem. The, the, uh, she's kicked the Trump trial so far down the road. She's got nothing but time on her hands now. It is interesting how she drew that case. I, I, I just look. The weirdness of this is the shamelessness of it. Now, I, I'm sure. Yes, lawyer friends will text me after this. Be like JVL, you don't understand. There's habeas corpus involved, and uh, you know, a, a criminal trial on the documents is different than this, and there are underlying constitutional issues which have to be resolved, and blah blah. blah. But I sure. thought she was so in over her head she couldn't even do. Like she had clerks quitting, and what? Ha- like, is that not true anymore? At some point, you just be like, didn't she feel like she needs to act, at least pretend to, like, you know, what? Couldn't she delay this case uh, by like a couple months just for form's sake? Because this is the equivalent of rubbing everybody's noses in it and saying, yeah, obviously, I obviously I was just kicking the can down the road for Trump on the other thing. Like, nobody even feels the need to pretend anymore, except for J.D. Vance. At least J.D. Vance cared enough to pretend for America. Is that where we're going to land I on this podcast? J.D. Vance. I, on this podcast have, is, J.D. I, Vance is good, actually. Like, I, I, do, <laughs> I, I just I want to close by saying that I, that if your criticism of me dear listener or colleague is that just my loathing of jd vance is so intense that it has blinded me to be able to be able to give fair check analysis <laughs> <laughs> i'm guilty i throw myself on the mercy of the court because i don't i i have never hated somebody so much in my life i don't think that even that anyone that i've met in person any public figure uh, it's possible i'm forgetting somebody trump I know. I, I would just like J.D. Vance way more than Trump. Oh, way I mean, more. I, Trump is I mean, what he I is. I find Trump more repellent, and I find him more scary in certain ways and whatever. But just as far as, like, the, that deep type of loathing, that thing that you can only feel down in your marrow, like, I, I just – I think that J.D. is is tops for me yeah. of, of, in history. And I think that is because Donald Trump only thrives – with the help of people like J.D. Vance. Like, J.D. Vance is the Aristotelian distillation of the person who makes Donald Trump successful. Yeah. Yeah, he's a Quisling. Right? I mean, this is, this is the history. It's the French village. Sarah, everything is the French village. Yeah, sometimes, we should rewatch that show. Can I, we talk about J.D. Vance's, do you guys, I, I need to ask this question because I wanted to say something about it, but I, I was unsure. We're at the end. Another thing, part of the podcast. We right are. Now. <laughs> I can't. Sorry, T- Tim. I know you have to go, so I'm just no, gonna. No, we're good. I we're guess, gonna I keep guess, talking yeah. about. Does JD Vance? Do you think he's wearing eyeliner, or do you think he just has naturally very long lashes? I can feel this one. I spent a um, I spent a lot of time reviewing this on the gay text chain, and um, it's pr- it's pretty unanimous that he's not wearing a guy liner. That he that that those are just his natural lashes. He has absolutely dyed his hair, and it's an and. I'm sorry, Jim Swift, close your ears. And it's an Ohio hair dye job. Uh, it's like not great. It's not great. Uh, you know, he's he has he randomly has grays on his on his beard. St- but like he didn't keep. You're supposed to have some strategic grays that you keep in there if you want it to look real. You know, and his is like multi toned. So uh, he's certainly hair dyeing and either starving himself or on Ozempic. I would have said Ozempic, but he seems really grumpy and angry. So I think he's probably starving himself. And uh, but I do think those are his natural lashes. I'm sorry to report. Okay, Uh, because I guess one of the things that I guess I find perplexing, and uh, I don't is just 
J.D. Vance, he was he was throwing hard blue steel last night. He does have very, like, nice eyes. The backdrop was really helping them pop. Uh, and I wondered if he was wearing eyeliner, mainly because, though, he's not... For, for them to have such a focus on manliness, on, like, their masculine properties and uh, whatever, Donald Trump just slathers himself in makeup. And J.D. Vance seems, like, very aware of his appearance mm. in a way that Walls... <laughs> Walls is, like... First of all, I'm just going to, again, with my... I did not... I wish that Walls... Like, whatever. Uh, he he looked older in, like, the matchup. Uh, but he also looked, like... He did look more authentically like a dude. Like, yeah, he Off the rack suit. <laughs> yeah, off the rack suit. Like... Got it at uh, Kohl's. <laughs> uh, and so, like, this, this, like... This, like, way in which Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are supposed to be, like, this authentically – it's just sort of like Josh Hawley talking about masculinity when, like, you watch him prance away running fast from the That's how uh, January 6th protesters. That's them. I Ted know. Ted Cruz. I know. Rich there's Lally. not a – there's I, not, like, yeah. a manly man in the whole bunch. It's a weird, weird projection fetish. It's like the Jack Murphy guy with the, the cucking and the pegging. I mean, it's it, every time you talk about this, I really don't want. I just want to move on. Mike uh, Johnson, not particularly right there. It is. It, 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 is, and, it so, is. And to be clear, it's not. I'm not critiquing their masculinity at all. I am critiquing their obsession. Yeah. With talking about and 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 causing the other side, you know, saying the other, you know, their obsession with masculinity, manhood, all of these things, while I think uh, presenting. A less than none of these great Republican masculine. hopes look yeah. like the dudes in the CNN boat parade video. Yeah, right. Is that is that what you're really trying to get at, Sarah? Yeah, Remember the I CNN boat parade I video I don't and those guys? Why people they find look them like compelling that. in that way? Like, where are we getting the idea that this is what? Uh, because they're going to get away with it. Was there mean? That's that's what we'll leave it on. It is the uh, team manhood trait meanness. They're mean. It's uh, these J.D. Vance is Rolo Tomasi. And this is where I, I really just as a just a piece of self-care, Tim, I think you need to let go of the J.D. Vance thing. I can't. Because he is going to get away with it. He'll be president someday. Who is Rolo Tomasi? In, in L.A. Confidential, Rolo Tomasi Got is the, the, the name that Ed, uh, Ed Exley the character Ed actually gives to the guy who shot his father in his, yeah. in his imagination. Cause he's well, Tomasi is the guy who got away with it. And yeah. go, if you guys haven't watched LA confidential so recently, good. go do that. Amazing movie. Um, he's gonna, he, he has an Ohio set. He's 40 years old. I know he has all of the money in the world. He has I need to get billionaire back benefactors. Yeah. It's uh, I'll deal I'm with just it. saying, I gotta, I gotta get back into therapy to deal with that. I think. All right, guys. Better help. We need come back. Be our sponsor again. <laughs> Good show. Long show. We'll be back next week when we will be under 30 days to go. Good luck, America. <laughs>